Okay, I have a show favorite. I have former CIA Ray McGovern back to talk about what's going on in Ukraine and Russia, what's going on with Israel and uh, Palestine, also what's going on with the Biden administration and some bombshell information coming out of Florida. Ray, thank you so much for joining me today. You're most welcome. All right. So um, usually you and I start off talking about Ukraine and Russia and Putin, but I'd like to start here in the United States. Um, just just within the last day, uh, the judge down in Florida, Eileen Cannon, she decided to unredact a bunch of government documents in there. It proved that Biden, the White House, White House Legal Counsel, the Department of Justice, the National Archives, and Jack Smith have all been colluding on these cases in order to get Donald Trump. Uh, some of them worked on uh, how to get into his Mar-a-Lago home. Some of them worked on gathering intel on the documents beforehand. Uh, they've all seemed to have colluded behind the scenes on getting the grand jury and uh, getting this case done. What, what are your thoughts on this? Obviously, Americans are pretty conflicted about Trump being, uh, you know, brought to court over documents and Biden basically not even getting a slap on the wrist about his document situation. What, what are your thoughts on this story? It's still developing. Um, so I, those are the details that I have right now. Well, Stephen, um, I'm not surprised. I would uh, feign a reaction of shock. <laughs> like that fellow in uh, with Humphrey Bogart there. But, uh, you know, it's not shocking. Let me quote the, uh, the head of the Senate uh, Ju Judiciary Committee, longtime head or ranking member, uh, the fellow from Iowa, uh, Grassley. Uh, when one of these uh, more exceptional cases came out where an FBI lawyer was proven to have falsify documents for a FISA request for wiretapping, wiretapping, for, for um, getting the information from, from the, the ether on various people, Americans. Uh, Grassley composed his own, his own Twitter, his own X, okay? And, and he said, my goodness, um, this just shows uh, that we are, in defending one another, uh, the Department of Just Us, not Department of Justice, but Department of Just Us. <laughs> no, this is Grassley, Senator Grassley, who is in charge of monitoring, overseeing, taking care that the that the that the laws of this country are respected and he's sort of mocking the, the reality, which is that it's just us, who ha whoever happens to be uh, predominant in the Justice Department right now, it's the, it's the Democrats. Well, you can expect this kind of thing from them. So I'm not surprised. And I would simply say that uh, uh, when you look at how uh, uh, President Trump coming in as a, a new new boy on the block, fresh from being a real estate mogul in in, in New York, inexperienced. Well, they, they really did a job on him. That's clear now. Uh, they said that the Russians were helping him, and it's quite clear now that they weren't. Those those hacked emails just didn't. They weren't hacked. And also, even Putin has recently said, you know. What I pride most of all on an American president is predictability, right? And uh, so, yeah, I, I prefer Joe Biden. Huh? <laughs> so all this business, I may have said this on your program before, but all this business, uh, getting beneath all the details, which are now proven us correct, that the Russia didn't hack and the Russia didn't try to influence the election, was my the premise going in that, the Russians would never favor Trump because he was un 
predictable. You don't need somebody unpredictable with their fingers on the nuclear code. So, yeah, if they're doing a job on them still, and now the records come out that they have done a job on them, and not just done a job on Joe Biden, well, the, the, the facts speak for themselves. Now, my wife is always telling me, uh, Ray, um, and I hear her voice in, in my ear, please, don't give anybody the the idea that you endorse uh, President Trump. I do not. This is a matter of just stating the facts. Uh, if you ask me my opinion of uh, uh, President Trump, I would give it, but it's not a favorable opinion, so I just won't give it. Okay. <laughs> um, this, this last week, uh, the House of Representatives passed this foreign aid package giving nearly a hundred billion dollars of taxpayer money over to ma mainly three different nations, Taiwan, Israel, and, and Ukraine. With the $60 billion that Ukraine now has, what, what are they going to do with it? How are they going to turn the tides of war on Vladimir Putin? We're, we're nearly $200 billion of taxpayer money into this war. And Ukraine has lost hundreds of thousands of soldiers and 20% of their land mass. I, I don't see how this ends up being a win for Ukraine. Well, Stephen, you're very perspicacious because it isn't, it doesn't have anything to do with Ukraine. Now, let me explain, okay? Uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Listen to President Biden. And an op-ed he wrote a week ago for the Wall Street Journal of all places. This is just a couple of sentences. If Congress passes this military aid for, for Ukraine, we won't write a blank check. We'll send military equipment from our own stockpiles. Then we'll use the money that was authorized by Congress to replenish those stockpiles by buying from American suppliers. This includes Patriot missiles made in Arizona, Javelin missiles made in Alabama, artillery shells made in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Texas. We'll be investing in America's in America's industrial base, buying American products made by American workers, supporting jobs in nearly 40, count them, 40 states, and strengthening our own national security. We'll help our friends while helping ourselves. That's the name of the game, Stephen. It's the military industrial complex. Why? Well, it's election year. You need to support. You need the lobby, uh, not only the Israel lobby, but you need the lobby that is very, very, very uh, powerful, the lobby of arms makers, arms uh, sellers, arms uh, giving people to Congress to load in their pockets here, and then uh, appropriating more money for making arms. It's what Eisenhower warned about, what, 60, 63 years ago now. And what he said was, uh, look, uh, the military industrial complex is a threat uh, to our democracy. And the only antidote to this is a well-informed American citizenry. Now, I would dare say most of our audience here probably believes that this $60 billion has something to do with Ukraine. It doesn't. It has to do with money. It has to do with winning the election in November. I'm sorry to say that, but you know, here's the president saying exactly that in my in my uh, in my notion here. Uh, the trajectory of Russia winning this war in Ukraine cannot be stopped unless unless these foolish sophomores tell Biden, "Look, we have these we had these low yield nuclear weapons." Yeah, we could use those. Oh, that would show the Russians a lesson, and maybe maybe that would get us by the election. Would I put it past these folks? I wouldn't. And that's why what's the hair on the back of my neck is standing up right now. I've been around a long time, Stephen. I've never seen us so close to the use of nuclear weapons, not by the Russians. They don't need to, but by us because of the election, because of the inevitable loss of Ukraine 
which is just months away. This new 60 billion is not gonna not gonna have any appreciable effect on it. And the wisest military advisors that that are around uh, have been saying that for a long time. Uh, the people who are advising Biden are saying just the opposite. Their record is not very good. Witness the fact that in July of last year, they persuaded Biden to say, Putin has already lost. And the head of the CIA said, ah, he's had a strategic defeat and the weakness of the Russian forces has been laid bare, end quote. Well, hello, it's a different kind of bear, right? The bear is winning. And I take no delight in that, of course, but that's the reality. And what I pity is the Ukrainian people who have already lost the flower of Ukrainian youth, maybe 400, 500,000. How many more have to die before we recognize that this was a fool's errand? Yeah, I, I think we won't realize that until the future. <laughs> you know, when you said, um, you know, that this money goes towards the industrial base, like it, like you could swap that word out for the military industrial complex and it would make sure. perfect sense as a writer. Uh, I could do that. Same thing. It, it almost sounds like a gaffe, like a mistake when Biden says we get to help our friends and help ourselves at the same time. Right. We get to help our corporate donors and ourselves get reelected at the same time. At right. The same time. <laughs> It, it's what a like, bargain. Yeah, what, what a bargain. bargain. <laughs> and it, it's almost like the gaffe that he had earlier this week when he was yelling and mad. And he said, how many times does Trump have to prove we can't be trusted? <laughs> and he meant to say he can't be trusted. Right. But it was a, a Freudian slip, um, you know, and unfortunately, you know, we are we are somewhat trapped uh, by this military industrial complex. Uh, Stephen, let, let me interject here because I was doing some research here, writing something, and uh, I kept thinking, well, why was it that why was it that Obama, president when Biden was vice president, was so loath, was so reluctant to give offensive military equipment to Ukraine? And I found this um, in the New York Times, 2015. Uh, Peter Baker, one of their uh, favorite uh, columnists from the New York Times and very well plugged in with the administration, uh, he said that uh, Obama has told his aides that, quote, arming the Ukrainians would encourage the notion that they could actually defeat the much more powerful Russians. And so it would potentially draw a more forceful response from Moscow, period, end quote. And then this is even more telling. I ask you to think of what high State Department official might have added this. It's a direct quote. Listen carefully, please. If you're playing on the military terrain of Ukraine, you are playing to Russia's strength because Russia is right next door. It has a huge amount of military equipment and military force right on the border. Anything we did as countries in terms of military support for Ukraine is likely to be matched and then doubled and then tripled and then quadrupled by Russia, period, end quote. The date was 2000, March 5th, 2015. The speaker was a fellow named Tony Blinken. Huh? <laughs> so Blinken is saying this, it's a fool's errand under Obama, he's saying, Obama, my president now is correct. This is really not gonna work because Russia's right there and we don't wanna give Ukraine the idea that they can beat a much more powerful Russia. And now, so what's changed? Well, all of a sudden Biden comes in and has Russia lost its industrial base? Have the borders changed? Have the Russians <laughs> have been lost? No. So this is how cynical things are and how unprincipled a person like Blinken is, all of a sudden it becomes not only necessary, but uh, but just completely, it just forces us to support our ally and in the same time, uh, support our military industrial complex. It's a win-win for us, not a win-win for the Ukrainian soldiers who perish on the battlefield. Yeah, the 
the thought I had while you were talking is Obama didn't have children or his family compromised by a relationship with Ukraine, but Biden does. Um, <laughs> that too. So, yeah. yeah, maybe Blinken, who covered up for the Hunter Biden laptop, is is uh, you know helping cover up for something in Ukraine. I, I don't know. I'm just saying it. You know, there is some kind of connection there to Ukraine that they did not want people to find out about. They impeached uh, Donald Trump over investigating. Um, so there, there's definitely um, something there. What, uh, you know, I know you can't ever exactly think like Vladimir Putin, but what might you guess his reaction was to seeing Congress pass more money for Ukraine and members of Congress illegally waving another country's flag on the congressional floor? What, what, what do you think he might have been thinking? Well, Stephen, I spent uh, f a half a century putting myself in the shoes of Russian and Soviet leaders. And he actually has said that he found this really outrageous, but understandable for the same reasons I had used before the military industrial complex. He said that the, there's not going to be any win out of this uh, and Russia will keep attriting the, the forces in Ukraine, and he's threatened to say, well, now, if they up the ante, let's say they put F-16s in play, which are capable of carrying nuclear weapons, that changes the ball game. We will shoot them down immediately and we'll attack the airfields from which they fly. So it's not a nonchalant kind of a reaction, but it's a completely predictable one from, from uh uh, Putin. And I dare say, I hope we stop short of that because uh, things are getting very dangerous and the French and the Poles and the Baltic folks are all itching for a fight with Russia. Uh, I think that the main, well, the main positive here is that Putin and his folks know they're winning know that this gradualist approach of a treading, a treading, a treading, uh, gives no real cause celebre, no, no big uh, uh, reason for the US or NATO to say, aha, cross the red line. And if they just keep a, a moderate pace here, that the battlefield will determine what happens. Meanwhile, and this should be emphasized, every Every interview that Putin or Lavrov, the, uh, the foreign ministry, give, they always say, we're ready to talk, we're ready to talk, but not on the basis of that formula, which, has, uh, which simply has us defeated and ceding back not only the rest of what we've gotten, but Crimea, that's ridiculous, that's Zelensky. We won't talk on that basis, but we're willing to talk. We're willing to talk. We may be just weeks before Zelensky is removed by someone willing to talk because the, the, the alternative is simply more losses on the Ukrainian side. And Ukrainian forces are now surrendering en masse and others are refusing orders uh, to engage the Russians. Yeah, yeah, I read that. Uh battalions that are just new to the battlefield. They don't have leadership. They don't have experience or knowledge. And they're just saying, we, we, we give up, we give in. Um, if you were to read CNN, Newsweek, uh, Daily Mail, um, uh, the, the Sun, you would think that Russia is suddenly losing because Joe Biden signed this money out of the U.S. Treasury. Is this just propaganda by the West to make uh, make Ukraine look like they have a, a fighting chance? Yes, in a word. You know, one hesitates to believe that they believe this stuff. They're dished out this uh, copy to repeat ad nauseum. I don't know when it will be that they will have to retreat and say, well, we were wrong. They won't say we were wrong. They'll say mm, something like this. China. China has been supporting the Russian economy during all this. And it's China that we is largely to blame for fortifying the Russian economy and Russian arms production to the point where they're winning in Ukraine. That's the kind of thing they'll come up with. And no one, 
no one will hold them accountable. Think back to Iraq, when weapons of mass destruction was on every tongue, there were none, and no one was held accountable. Yeah. Okay. Let, let, let's, let's stay in that vein. You and I talked a little bit about this before. Um, you, you have spent much of your adult life trying to educate people on the wrong of the U.S. attacking Iraq. Um, I think you're now spending a lot of your time trying to help people understand the Israel-Gaza situation. Um, there, there is a flotilla to protest the, the war. I believe it's coming from Turkey uh, down the Black Sea and into the Mediterranean. Um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about that. And then um, is there anything that can be done? Because on the one hand, you have the United Nations not really doing anything. Uh, you have other world organizations not really doing anything. Uh, some countries are saying this is genocide. Others are saying, no, they're running the cleanest war. And yet they're finding mass graves now. I know that's a, a big convoluted question, but I, I, I may, maybe start with the flotilla and then work us in. Well, it's the International Court of Justice that has said that it's a plausible case of genocide. So uh, people are not making that up. Um, genocide is accompanied by famine, by starvation. Um, I, mean, I come from Ireland and my great, great parents came over to the United States because of starvation imposed by the British. A million people killed in Ireland, another million came to the United States. So we're talking about people starving to death and the UN organs that follow this have said uh, by May, Northern Gaza will have not enough food. There will be people, more and more people dying. So now uh, Netanyahu has not been able, not been willing to open the, the avenues to allow thousands, and I say that advisedly, thousands of trucks loaded with supplies into Gaza. Now, some have trickled in over the last two weeks, but not nearly enough. So starvation is part of the plan. I hate to, you know, I hate to say that, but that's part of the plan of genocide. So what are these, these people in Turkey doing? It's an international flotilla. They have a big ship that's loaded with 5,500 5, tons of medical supplies and food and other things, ambulances, and they're hoping to land in Gaza, disgorge this equipment, and help the Gazan people. Now, this has been tried before, and the Israelis have always turned these flotillas back, including in 2010, when they attacked a, a Turkish ship of considerable size and killed 10 people, okay? So these people are very courageous, but they say that we just can't wait for the governments to, to come in, for the UN to sit back and say, well, no, the Israelis say that some of these relief agencies, people were, were cooperating with Hamas with no proof. So they're gonna sail. Now they're on board, I'm just told today, they embarked, they're on those ships. There's one great big ship and then there are two uh, passenger ships, okay? So the question is, will the Turks give them permission to do this? Now the Turks speak a, you know, talk a good game. Uh, right after, right after the, this went down in October, oh, we're sending flotillas, we'll send them, but they never did. So will they, will they risk suffering the opprobrium of, of Muslims worldwide in denying uh, this flotilla, a peaceful flotilla. Some of these people I know are from departing Turkey and going to Israel. Israel, of course, doesn't want them to go. The United States doesn't want them to go. It'll be interesting to see if they put enough pressure on Erdogan to, so that my friends uh, stay in port for a long period of time or are never able to leave. It's a very delicate diplomatic situation. Again, the Turks don't want to seem miserly or trying to prevent necessary uh, steps to prevent more starvation, but we'll just have to see how much pressure is brought to bear on them. Now, I have to confess, Stephen, that I was on such a flotilla in 2011. 
But the year after the Israelis landed on the Turkish ship, the Mavi Marmara, and killed 10 people. Now, what happened in my case, in the case of 40 other people, including uh, some, some people from the press, was that Netanyahu would not guarantee our, our safe passage. And so Obama, what did Obama do? He said, oh, well, okay, I'll lean on the Greeks. We were in Athens. We're about to sail. Uh, he told the Greeks, don't let these guys get out of the harbor of Piraeus. And the Greeks said, well, no, no, we're a seafaring nation. That would be against our whole ethos. He said, you do it or you don't get an IMF loan. Greeks were in really bad shape economically. That's how it went down. We were kept, well, we actually made a break for it. Nine nautical miles out into the Aegean and Greek Coast Guard came in very apologetically and said, you know, we're sorry, but we have these orders. And when it looked like they were about to board us, our captain said, okay, we got to go back to Athens. And the, the ship, the, the boat was impounded and we lost all the, all the financing that, that we put into that ship to make it a U.S. ship registered in the United States and outfitted for the journey to get to Gaza. Okay, now I might have I might have missed this. Were you so were you going from Greece to Gaza? That's correct. Yeah, you know, we were we were in Athens. That's where we fixed up this this boat. It wasn't much of a boat, but there were four. Alice Walker was one of the people on our on our delegation. Medea Benjamin and Anne Wright, and some of the same people who are now in Turkey on board trying to get get permission to leave. So. You know, it's a really kind of sad thing that uh, there is this embargo, this blockade around Gaza where people can't even arrive by ship and dis discharge or disgorge the equipment that they bring with them. We'll have to see what happens. I just hope that, uh, that the same fate that befell those people on the Turkish ship in 2010 doesn't befall uh, the people on this flotilla to break the siege of Gaza. I read I read this morning that the pier that the US military is trying to build to bring food and supply that it was attacked by Hamas. Uh, again, mm. I'm reading western media, so I I don't know how much of it is true, how much of it is propaganda. I know that mm. there was some worry about the mili the US military being in the region um, as you know, even though Hamas might want help. They also have bad feelings towards the United States. So I, I'm not sure if this is a fake story or a real story. Well, Stephen, the way I come down on this one is that if Biden got on the phone and called Netanyahu and said, no more arms aid until you let those trucks into Gaza, that's where the, that's where the food and the other supplies are already there. They're right outside the gates of Gaza. That's what the solution is. This business about building a, a, a temporary thing on uh, offshore Gaza, and then what happens to it what, <clears throat> when, when, when it gets into Gaza? Who who controls it? Well, it would be the Israeli authorities. So it's really, you know, some people think, and I think there's reason to believe this, that that pier would be used mostly for Palestinians to get on other ships and go abroad for resettlement in other nations. And of course, that's been the Palestinians' fate all along. Uh, get them out of there. Get them out of Gaza now. Get them out and put them on these other ships so, so that we don't have to worry about them anymore, say the Israelis. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. Oh, I hate covering these war topics. <laughs> they're, uh, they're definitely no, no fun. Um, Final, final question for you. I don't know if you saw this, um, but at least 13 banks colluded with the Fed to spy on transactions for hundreds of pro-gun, pro-religion Americans uh, that they believe could have been involved in the January 6th situation. All of that was done without a warrant. Uh, is the United States just desperate to uh, spy and know everything about the American people? Is this what Edward Snowden was trying to warn us of? Uh, is Big Brother constantly looking at everything we do? The answer is yes, yes, yes. Uh, Ed Snowden is a friend of mine, 
Uh, we gave him an award right after he revealed um, how our government was playing fast and loose with the Fourth Amendment. Now, the Fourth Amendment is my favorite. I mean, it's easy. It's it's clear as a bell. You can't fool around with it. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, places, houses, and effects from unreasonable search and seizure shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue except upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and specifically defining the places to be searched or the persons or things to be seized, period. Okay, no warrant shall issue except upon probable cause. Well, my God, uh, they're violating that right and left. And they have just, the president's just signed a bill uh, with section 702 in it which authorizes this stuff in direct violation. There's no warrants required of some of this monitoring of American citizens. So yeah, do I feel strongly about this? <laughs> I really do because it's this first step to what Ed Snowden called turnkey tyranny. A little, little vignette here. Uh, we, some of my colleagues and I were in, were in Berlin and we visited the old Stasi, the secret service of the East Germans. And there was a fellow named Wolfgang Schmidt there who had been there for a long time, worked in the Stasi. And we said, Wolfgang, what do you say to people who say, uh, I don't care if they monitor everything I have or my emails or my, I have nothing to hide. And Wolfgang says, this is incredibly naive. You don't get to decide what they use against you. The only way to prevent it from being used against you is to prevent it from being collected in the first place. <laughs> oh <my> God, <laughs> <you know? laughs> so do they read this stuff? Do they listen to it when it's collected? No, you know, but they put it in a file for Stephen Gardner or Ray McGovern and they can pick it out anytime they wish. So Fourth Amendment, warrants, it's all passe now. And, uh, you know, it's it will come to a real serious pass because we need to step up now. Uh, we have need to be winter soldiers, as uh, Tom Paine would say, and put our bodies into it and say, look, you know, the Constitution for us is sacred. You're not going to get away with this. And our representatives and senators need to see us in person. And we need to say, look, change your ways here or you don't get voted back in. So that's it. that and other things like demonstrations are, are, you know, the time has come for putting our bodies into it. I feel certain. Yeah. Um, my, my daughters had a dance competition last weekend and we just so happened to drive past the NSA building in Utah on our, on our way home late at night, there were helicopters and police that block off. You can't even, start up the road or they they start chasing down towards you anyway my nine-year-old said to me um, daddy what's what's that building and why are there police and i said uh oh that's the building where the government spies on us so that they can use information about us and my my wife was like hey whoa that's a little too adult <laughs> you know but <laughs> It was the truth, right? Like, I wanted her to know, hey, that's the building where they are spying on us. <laughs> yeah, uh, Stephen, let me just ask you how long it took you at 25 miles an hour to drive past that building. It's the biggest building of its kind in the United States, okay? And what's stored in there? What stored it, you know, those little thumb drives, you know, how much, how much information you keep on one of those thumb drives? Well, this storage of, of even more miniaturized stuff in there in the biggest building of its kind in the United States of America. They now have another one at uh, NSA headquarters in Maryland, but still this dwarfs, the one in Utah dwarfs uh, any other building and what they're storing it, it, it's incredible. You know, when my colleagues in veteran intelligence professionals for sanity ex-technical directors from NSA told me, Ray, uh, you know, they're collecting everything. And I would say, come on, Bill, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that strange credulity. He says, look, he says, they can. And they because they can, they are 
And that's where it's going. And to Utah and other places, they're stirring it. And, it, you know, they're not just stirring it like I store my stuff here in this office. No, they, they label it so they can retrieve it. And the only way to prevent them from using it is to prevent them from collecting it in the first place. And you can't do that the way they're playing fast and loose with the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, absolutely. It is It is a very large building. And my understanding is the majority of it is underground. So it's even bigger than than what uh, most of us would realize. And they suck up hundreds of thousands of gallons of water from the lake to cool all those servers. And then they dump it back out after supposedly purifying it, probably adding fluoride or something. Who knows? But uh, Ray, thank you very much for coming on. I, I value your time. Um, we'll just continue to, to monitor how these two wars develop and, and just hope and pray that uh, we don't get pulled into something nuclear or, or much worse. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You're most welcome.